Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is on the book of Genesis. And if you remember correctly, Genesis in Greek means beginnings. So this is a story about the beginnings, the book of beginnings, if you will. And this particular lesson is number eight in that series entitled The Promise. It's a lesson from May 21 of 2022. And as usual, we like to begin with a word of prayer. Father, we have come today to talk about you, to think about you, to try to understand more clearly why you interacted with human beings in these various ways so long ago. Help us to understand the people, their circumstances, and exactly why you chose to react with with them or interact with them in these ways. May we understand these things as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This lesson will cover approximately 60 years of, in the life of Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac. It includes one, the birth of Isaac, two, the dismissal of Hagar and Ishmael, three, Abraham's trip to Mount Moriah to sacrifice Isaac, for the death of Sarah, five Abraham's purchase of land for her burial, and for the first time actually owning property in Canaan, six, the long process of finding a wife for Isaac when he was about 40 years old, seven, the marriage of Abraham to Keturah, eight, the six sons that were born to her, nine, Abraham apportioning his inheritance to his eight sons, 10, the death of Abraham, and 11, the birth of Isaac's two sons, Esau and Jacob. 60 years. Wow. Jim? Finally, as God had promised, Sarah bore Abraham a son in his old age, Genesis 21, verse 2. And he named the baby Isaac. See Genesis 21, 1 to 5. But the story of Abraham is far from over, reaching a climactic moment when he took his son to Mount Moriah to be sacrificed. Isaac, however, is replaced by a ram, Genesis 22:13, which signified God's commitment to bless the nations through his seed, Genesis 22:17 and 18. That seed, of course, was Jesus, Acts 13:23. Hence, in this astonishing and in some ways troubling story, more of the plan of salvation is revealed from the Bible study guide for May 14. Okay. So, can we wrap our minds around all those things in a few minutes? God had promised Sarah that she would have a son, Genesis 17, 1 through 28, while Abraham was laughing. Why did God wait so long to give Abraham and Sarah that son? He was given as a miracle baby. God could have given him at any time. So, 20 years later, when Abraham was 120 years old and Isaac was 20, Think about their relative strength, etc. at that point. Abraham was instructed by God in a dream or in a vision in the night to take his son, the son of the promise, and sacrifice him on Mount Moriah, even though God had promised Abraham many descendants through Isaac. No question about it. To this son, you're going to have many descendants. Okay, now take him and kill him. Hmm. So would Isaac have been as much a miracle if he were given at age 80 as if he were given at age 100? Well, Abraham had been trying for a long time and they hadn't, had, hadn't had any children, so whenever it happened, it would have been something of a miracle. But obviously, it's, it's more impressive that she had a baby after she'd stopped having periods and everything. Sarah, yeah. Okay. Gary, I think that's yours. Yes, Genesis 22, 1 through 19. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He called to him, Abraham. And Abraham answered, yes, here I am. Take your son, God said, your only son, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. There on a mountain that I will show you, offer him as a sacrifice to me. Early the next morning, Abraham cut some of the wood for the sacrifice, loaded his donkey, and took Isaac and two servants with him. 
they started out for the place that God had told him about. Up Can I interrupt for a second? And where was Sarah? She's supposed to be staying at home. Not even informed. They just disappeared. They started out for the place that God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham saw the place in the distance. Then he said to the servants, Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there and worship, and then we will come back to you. Notice, we will come back to you. Yeah. Abraham made Isaac carry the wood for the sacrifice, and he, and he himself rather carried a knife and live coals for starting the fire. Now there's another question that I have. They've now walked for two days and two nights at least. They're working on the third day now. And you're carrying fire? Now some translations suggest that he was carrying flint and a knife of some kind so that he could strike a fire. Yeah. But I, I mean, you, uh, yeah, you could, I know people who keep their fires in their homes in Africa going day and night for years and never let it go out. But it's, you know, they, they stoke it up, they, they bury, kind of bury, half bury it at nighttime, and then they break it out in the morning and they put more wood on and so forth, and the fire comes up again. But carrying it? Yeah. For three days? For three days? It must have been a case of flint and, and knife or something. I, I, I can't imagine. I don't know. Just speculating. As they walked along, Carrie? Abraham made Isaac carry the wood for the sacrifice, and he himself carried a knife and live coals, starting the fire. As they walked along, Isaac said, Father, he answered, Yes, my son. Isaac asked, I see that you have the coals and the wood, but where is the lamb for the sacrifice? Abraham answered, God himself will provide one. And the two of them walked on together. And we're going to see that there's some very interesting implications in the way it's worded in Hebrew when we study this more carefully. When they came to the place which God had told him about, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. He tied up his son and placed him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he picked up the knife to kill him. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, he answered, Yes, here I am. Don't hurt the boy or do anything to him, he said. Now I know that you honor and obey God because you have not kept back your only son from him. Abraham looked around and saw a ram caught in a bush by its horns. He went and got it, offered it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Abraham named that place the Lord provides. And even today, people say on the Lord's mountain, he provides. He certainly did provide, didn't he? Yeah. Keep going. Mm -hmm. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time. I make a vow by my own name. The Lord is speaking that I will richly bless you. Because you did this and did not keep back your only son from me, I promise that I will give you as many descendants as there are stars in the sky or grains of sand along the seashore. Your descendants will conquer their enemies. All can I interrupt for a second? How many stars can you see with the naked eye? How many stars in the sky can you see with the naked eye without any binoculars or telescope or anything? Depends upon where you're looking yeah. from. If you're looking yeah. from downtown Los Angeles, not very many. <laughs> yeah. oh, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that you're in a place where you can see fairly clearly. Yeah. If you're looking at it from the mountains of the Sierras, it's thousands and yeah. thousands and thousands. Well, no, not thousands and thousands, about 4,000. That's thousands and thousands. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Your descendants will conquer their enemies. All the nations will ask me to bless them as I have blessed your descendants, all because you obeyed my command. Abraham went back to his servants, and they went together to Beersheba, where Abraham settled. What do you think, and I'm going to ask this question, what do you think the servants who, Abraham said, you wait here, what did they say when the Abraham and his 
son came back, what did they ask? What, what you been doing? Yeah, what you been doing? <laughs> did you offer a sacrifice? What was your sacrifice? And Sarah, when they got home, yeah. I mean, she must have had a lot of questions. How certain was Abraham that the voice he had heard in the middle of the night was God's voice? Would you be willing to depart on a two or three day walking journey to sacrifice a child based on that amount of evidence? Of course, Scripture says that as they approached Mount Moriah, Abraham saw the sign over the mount, confirming in his mind that it had been God's voice. Okay? Dwayne, I think it's yours. That day, the longest that Abraham had ever experienced, dragged slowly to its close. While his son and the young men were sleeping, he spent the night in prayer, still hoping that some heavenly messenger might come to say that the trial was enough, that the youth might return unharmed to his mother. But no relief came to his tortured soul. Another long day, another night of humiliation and prayer, while ever the command that was to leave him childless was ringing in his ears. Satan was near to whisper doubts and unbelief, but Abraham resisted his suggestions. This, this remind, sound, reminds me a lot of Garden of Gethsemane. Mm -hmm. Boy. Yes. As they were there about to begin the journey of the third day, the patriarch looking northward saw the promised sign a cloud of glory hovering over Mount Moriah that he knew, and he knew that the voice which had spoken to him was from heaven. So what was that cloud, of, and that was Patriarchs and Prophets from Ellen White, page 151. What was that cloud of glory? Was it like a pillar of fire that led Israel? Doesn't the sacrifice of Isaac fly in the face of commandments later given by God to the children of Israel and his later directions against human sacrifices? What important lessons are we to learn from the experience on Mount Moriah? At the climax of that experience on Mount Moriah, suddenly Isaac's life was spared and a ram was provided as a substitute. Now, as you could guess, people who make a great deal about substitution and the legal aspects of religion, this is a huge deal. Oh, substitution. Um, there's a lot more to the plan of salvation than substitution, but uh, we don't have time to talk about that right now. What did the universe learn from that experience? Is it clear in your mind that nothing that we can do, even something so incredible as Isaac, Isaac's willingness to be sacrificed and Abraham's willingness to offer Isaac, could earn salvation? Our only hope of salvation is as a free gift from God. Now, it should be perfectly clear to all of us, and I hope it's clear to all of you out there, that there's nothing we can do to earn our way to heaven. What can we learn from the story of Abraham and Isaac on Mount Moriah about the atonement? Remember that the word atonement comes from at one meant. How does this story bring us closer to God? The sacrifice required of Abraham was not alone for his own good, nor solely for the benefit of the succeeding generations, but it was also for the instruction of the sinless intelligences of heaven and of other worlds. The field of the controversy between Christ and Satan, the field on which the plan of redemption is wrought out, is the lesson book of the, of the universe, because Abraham had shown a lack of faith in God's promises Satan had accused him before the angels and before God of having failed to comply with the conditions of the covenant and as unworthy of its blessings. God desired to prove the loyalty of his servant before all heaven to demonstrate that nothing less than perfect obedience can be accepted and to open more fully before them the plan of salvation. Okay, so God's in the process of refuting whose accusations? Satan. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Heavenly beings were witnesses of the scene as the faith of Abraham and the substitution of Isaac were submission. tested. Submission. I'm sorry, submission of Isaac was 
were tested. The trial was far more severe than that of which had been brought upon Adam. Compliance of the prohibition laid upon our first parents involved no suffering, but the command to Abraham demanded the most agonizing sacrifice. All heaven beheld with wonder and admiration Abraham's unfaltering obedience. All heaven applauded his fidelity. Satan's accusations were shown to be false. God had declared to his servant, Now I know that thou fearest God, notwithstanding Satan's charges. Seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. God's covenant confirmed that Abraham, by an oath before the intelligences of the world, testified that obedience will be rewarded. Now I want to ask you a question here. Does this mean that the focus of the entire universe is on planet Earth? Hmm. It sure appears that way. It at, looks at like it. Four nine. Uh, at that time, it was not just on planet Earth. It was on yes. Abraham and Isaac individual. Individual. Yeah. and Mount Moriah. Yeah. Wow. And I can tell you there are other places where Ellen White says very clearly that every case is known as clearly as if that individual were the only one living. Hmm. Go ahead. Okay. It has been difficult even for the angels to grasp the mystery of redemption, to comprehend that the commander of heaven the Son of God must die for guilty man. When the command was given to Abraham to offer his son, the interest of all heavenly beings was enlisted. Here we have it, all heavenly beings. With intense earnestness, they watched each step in the fulfillment of this command. When Isaac's question, where is the lamb for the burnt offering, Abraham made answer, God will provide himself a lamb. And when the father's hand was stayed as he was about to slay his son, and the ram which God had provided was offered in the place of Isaac, then light was shed on the mystery of redemption. Even the angels understood more clearly the wonderful provision that God had made for man's salvation. 1 Peter 1, 12. And let me see if I can get my... and prophets. Yeah. Look at this. God uh, revealed to these prophets that their work was not for their own benefit, but for, the, for yours, as they spoke about the things which you have now heard from the messengers who announced the good news by the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. These are... Hold on here. These are things which even the angels would like to understand. Even the angels would like to understand. So, when Abraham was described as showing a lack of faith in God's promises, was that only the half-truth that Abraham had told to Pharaoh? Or was it also not believing God after having a son through Sarah and taking Hagar as a concubine or even more? How many times do we find Abraham not quite doing what he was supposed to do? What other, what other times do we know? I mean, apart, apart from... Well, what major times do we know other than those two? Oh, he, he also lied to the king of Gerar. Well, that's the, same, that, same. that's the half-truth. Yeah, same thing. Yeah. yeah. And... Um, is, the, is that what, what Satan was focusing on, do you think, those two episodes? Well, I, I look at the great controversy as being the overarching theme in all of this. So I think... Satan looked down on the world and he said, I've just about got everybody on my side except for Abraham. I'm going to get him. Somehow or other, I'm going to get this man. That's the way I see this story. And uh, I, I, to think about it like that is just amazing. Well, It, it makes it sound, though, uh, in this context, I, mm -hmm. not that I believe that, but that you have to be perfect in mm -hmm. order to go to heaven. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm not going to make that. Well, no, no. 
And it, obviously, Abraham took a while to get there. <laughs> you think so? I don't have as many years as Abraham had. I see. No, what does perfect mean in the Bible? Or did it in the right direction? Mature. It means it means go grown up. It means you've you've lived through a lot of experiences and you're still headed in the right direction. Okay. I like that. We live. Yeah. So, going back in that the first paragraph in that quote from Patriarchs and Prophets about six line down it says because Abraham had shown a lack of faith in God's promises Satan had accused him before the angels and before God mm -hmm. of having to, failed to comply. With it. You know, Mm -hmm. Is he accusing each of us also? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, he's correct that I have shown a lack of faith. Mm hmm Okay, how many people have lived on this earth that didn't show a lack of faith? Only Jesus. Only one. So God knows that. So the question is, what's the question? Are you going to be safe to live next door to for the rest of eternity? Now, to many Christians who believe in once saved, always saved, and those other very legal answers to the plan of salvation, that's heresy. But it's very clear, if you, if you take the great controversy, if you, it has to be like that. God cannot admit to heaven anyone that's just going to start the great controversy all over again. Just can't do that. So, when you talk about being perfect, what we're really saying is, You've grown experience enough, Hebrews, we studied last quarter, Hebrews uh, 5, 17 to 6, 4, right there it says, you've got an experience, you know how to distinguish between good and evil. You're not going to be deceived. So we live in a little blue marble, the third planet from the sun, in a relatively minor galaxy. Is it possible that the life of Abraham and his foibles and victories were actually the focus of the inhabitants of the vast entire universe? Sure. Sounds well, like it, doesn't it? Uh, yeah. uh, you know, Ellen White sure said so. It's all, it, it's education. It's an education process. Ellen White says, the, I guess it's in the book, Education. Uh, redemption is education, or education is redemption. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 everybody's going to have to learn, how, uh, learn about evil. Yeah. Why did God... The Bible is a book of good and evil. Mm -hmm. Why did God give Abraham such a test? So reading from the Adult Bible Study Guide for Sunday, Genesis 22 has become a classic in world literature and has inspired philosophers and artists, not just theologians. The meaning of God's test is difficult to comprehend, however. This divine command contradicts the later biblical prohibition against human sacrifices, Leviticus 18.21, and it surely seemed to work against God's promise of an eternal covenant through Isaac in Genesis 15.5. The biblical notion of test in Hebrews, Missa, uh, embraces two opposite ideas. It refers to the idea of judgment, that is, a judgment in order to know what is in the heart of the tested one. So it's a test, that's the, that's the definition of a test. Deuteronomy 8.2 and compare Genesis 22.12. But it also brings the assurance of God's grace on behalf of the tested as in Exodus 22, mm -hmm. pardon me, 20, verses 18 to 20. In this case, Abraham's faith in God takes him to the point that he runs the risk of losing his future, that is his pro posterity. Okay, so now let's stop for just a second to put this picture, full, full picture here. How much of, of his past has Abraham left behind? Well, he left everything. He left everything. So he's cut himself off from his past, and now we're talking about cutting himself off from the future. Cutting him off from, all, from his uh, legacy, from yeah. his ch children. Wow. Go ahead. And yet, because he trusts God, he will do what God asks, no matter how difficult it all is to understand. After all, what is faith if not trust in, an, in what we don't see or fully understand? And uh, I think we have a different definition coming up. Yeah. All, go ahead. 
Also, biblical faith is not so much about our capacity to give to God and to sacrifice for him, though that has a role, no doubt, but also our capacity to trust him and to receive his grace while understanding just how undeserving we are, again, from Bible Study Guide for Sunday. Okay, so clearly faith is a major issue. In fact, Paul, what did he say to the Philippian jailer? All you need to do is believe. The only requirement for salvation is faith. So I think we need to nail that down. Based on all of Scripture, a biblical definition of faith stated so well so many times by one of God's best modern friends, Dr. A. Graham Maxwell, is as follows. And I hope you understand all of this if you get this, this particular idea firmly cemented in your mind, you will be way, way, way ahead of most Christians. Faith is just a word we use to denote a relationship with God as with a person well known. The better we know him, the better this relationship may be. We can't say will be because we know the story of Lucifer who knew him for how many hundreds, thousands, maybe millions of years? We don't know. Faith implies an attitude toward God of love, trust, and deepest admiration. It means having enough confidence in him based upon the more than adequate evidence uh, revealed to be willing to believe whatever he says as soon as we are sure that he is the one who has said it, to accept whatever he offers uh, as soon as we are sure he's the one offering it, and to do whatever he wishes, as soon as we're sure he's the one wishing it, who wishes it, without reservation for the rest of eternity. So that's the definition of a person who is safe to save. Yeah. Anyone? Hmm? Yeah, yeah, I'm just interjecting here, interrupting as Yeah, that's all right, know. as I do um, all the time. Yeah, um, this is that third day Abraham, looked, Abraham looks up, and sees the cloud, and that was his... That's his confirmation. That's his confirmation. That's how yeah. he knew that it was. And we have to have the faith that there will be something that we will look at and know that that is God. And I remember when I was young that um, you were supposed to go out to the world and you're supposed to tell them, Jesus is coming again soon, and when you run across uh, someone who is doubting, you say, well, look it. Uh, um, Second Peter 3 says at the end there will doubters that will come so you're proof that Jesus is coming again soon because you're a doubter <laughs> I heard that and found out it wasn't quite that simple yeah well anyone who has such faith is perfectly safe to save and that is the key this is why faith is the only requirement for salvation. If you want to put a, a note there, that's Acts 16, verse 31. Faith also means that, like Abraham, Job, and Moses, God's friends, we know God well enough to reverently ask him why. If something happens that we can't understand, don't hesitate. He may be a God. He may be the one who made the entire universe but he's quietly waiting for us to ask him why. This does not suggest that there's nothing for us to do. Abraham believed God because of his faith. God accepted him as righteous. And what does it say in James 2, 18 to 24, Jim? But someone will say, one person has faith, another has actions. My answer is, show me how anyone can have faith without actions. I will show you my faith by my actions. Do you believe that there is only one God? Good. The demons also believe and tremble with fear. <laughs> That's you, helpful, huh? You fool. Do you want to be shown as that faith without actions is useless? How was our ancestor Abraham put right with God? It was through his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. Cannot is it can't you see his faith and his actions work together his faith was made perfect through his actions and the scripture came true that said abraham believed god and because of his faith god accepted him as righteous and so abraham was called god's friend you see then that it is by people's actions that they are put right with god and not by their faith alone 
goodness Bible. Okay. Have you had any tests or experiences in your life that remind you of Mount Moriah? Challenge for you out there. Think about that. Have you personally had any experiences that remind you of Mount Moriah? If you do not read or do not understand Hebrew, you would not know that there's a very interesting point made regarding the story. And earlier I had mentioned that we would see some interesting stuff going on here. Carrie? When Isaac asked about the sacrificial animal, Abraham gave an intriguing answer. God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. That's Genesis 22. Eight. God will do what? Provide, provide himself. for himself. Yeah. Hmm. Go ahead. Uh, yet the Hebrew verbal form can actually mean God will provide himself as the lamb. The verb provide ya a lo is used in a way that can mean provide himself or literally see himself. What we are being shown here then is the essence of the plan of salvation, which the Lord himself suffering and paying in himself the penalty for our sins. An old Sabbath school Bible study guide. Um, oh, question. Is it payment for our sins that is needed? Or do we need to be transformed and changed and so that we can be safe to live next door to for the rest of eternity? Does this story of the events leading up to and, and at Mount Moriah help us to better understand what happened at the cross? Dwayne? There at Mount Moriah, long before the cross, the sacrificial ram caught in a thicket by his horns was pointing right to Jesus. He is one that is seen here, as Abraham explains later, in the mount where the Lord is seen, Genesis 22, 14. Jesus himself had pointed to Abraham's prophetic utterance here when he said, echoing Abraham's statement, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. You remember that discussion at the end of John 8, verse 50, end of John 8, that discussion? Three times Jesus said, Yahweh, before, well, and basically he said, I am who I am. And what that's the name for God, isn't it? He said it twice, and still they didn't believe him. Then he said it the third time, and they were starting to get a little concerned. And then he said, before Abraham was, I am. And they said, okay, now it's time to pick up our stones, because you are claiming to be the Messiah. Okay, go ahead. It was to impress Abraham's mind with the reality of the gospel, as well as to test his faith that God commanded him to slay his son. The agony which he endured during the dark days of that fearful trial was permitted that he might understand from his own experience something of the greatness of the sacrifice made by the infinite God for man's redemption. Wow. Isaac was a figure of the Son of God who was offered as sacrifice for the sins of the world. God would impress upon Abraham the gospel of salvation to man. In order to do this and make the truth a reality to him as well as to test his faith, he required him to slay his darling Isaac. At all the sorrow and agony that Abraham endured through that dark and fearful trial were for the purpose of deeply impressing upon his understanding the plan of redemption for a fallen man. Does it deeply impress that upon us? He was made to understand in his own experience how unutterable was the self-denial of the infinite God and in giving his own son to die to rescue man from, the utter, from utter ruin. To Abraham, no mental torture could be equal to that which he endured in obeying the divine command to sacrifice his son. So, Myra, I read your passage there, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, 369. How many of us would be willing to give, up, give our lives or the lives of any of our children as an offering to God? What kind of offering does God really want? Now you can. Okay, Romans 12, 1. So then, my brothers and sisters, because of God's great mercy to us, I appeal to you. Offer yourselves 
as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to his service and pleasing to him. This is the true worship that you should offer. So God says, I want what kind of sacrifices? Living sacrifices. I don't want any more dead lambs or even dead people. I want, a, I want people out there who are studying their Bibles, praying and witnessing for me. Well, back to our story. Sarah had been intimately involved with many of Abraham's problems. Among other things, that this is revealed by one, a time in Egypt when she either openly or in her silence agreed to the half-truth that she was Abraham's sister. And two, the suggestion that Abraham should take Hagar as a concubine in order to have an heir, an heir, because she was the one who suggested it, wasn't she? It was probably not too long after that event on Mount Moriah that Sarah died. While it is true that we have no records rec uh, recorded of Sarah's learning about the near death of Isaac, there is no doubt that she found out about it. What did she say to Abraham and to Isaac when they returned? Is it possible that the shock of hearing about what almost happened to Isaac at Mount Moriah contributed to Sarah's death? Well, it's possible. I mean, what if Abraham re had returned without him? What would that have done to her? After Sarah died, Abraham purchased a burial ground for her. That was his first possession in the land of Canaan. And I don't know, it's impossible to know how accurately we know where these, these places are, but if you go today to the land of Hebron, I mean to the city of Hebron in Palestine, you'll find out that there's the the border between Jewish territory and um, Muslim territory runs right through the church, which is where this burial place takes place. So the Jews are able to come to one side of the church and the Muslims are able to come on the other side. It's a very, you can look that up on the internet if you want to look under Google images and you'll see it just an incredible experience. Okay. Genesis 23, 12 through 19 from Good News Bible. But Abraham bowed before the Hittites and said to Ephron, so that everyone could hear, may I ask you please to listen? I will buy the whole field, accept my payment and I will bury my wife there. Ephron answered, sir, land worth only 400 pieces of silver. What is that between us? Bury your wife in it. Abraham agreed and weighed out the amount that Ephron had mentioned in the hearing of the people, 400 pieces of silver, according to the standard weights used by the merchants. How much is 400 pieces of silver? Is that well, A piece of silver, wages? probably, yeah. So it's a pretty good chunk of change. So over a year's salary mm -hmm. for a laborer. Huh? That is how the property which had belonged to Ephron of Machpelah east of Mamre became Abram's. It included the field, the cave which was in it, and all the trees in the field up to the edge of the property. It was recognized as Abram's property by all the Hittites who were there at the meeting. Then Abram buried his wife Sarah in the cave in the land of Canaan. So the field which, he, which had belonged to the Hittites and the cave in it became the property of Abraham for a burial ground. Okay. Now, after having been in the land of Palestine for, I guess, 45 years at least, at least 45 years, finally, Abraham can put a stake down. I actually own a piece of property here. I'm just not wandering around just with my flocks here and there. But God had told him the whole area is yours. That's right. Abraham. Sarah's death. So, so was this going out against? Uh, you know, well, he needed a place to God. bury Sarah, and so he said, I, "I want, I want you all to recognize, we're putting our stake down. We belong here." I don't know what he told them about the rest of that promise from God, but <laughs> Sarah's death, followed by the purchase of that land from the Hittites, and then Abraham's refusal to have Isaac himself go to Haran to pick out a wife. He might have stayed there. All suggest that Abraham was taking all necessary steps to make sure that his heritage would remain where? In Canaan. 
Genesis 24, recording the story of Abraham and Eliezer's efforts to get a wife for Isaac, is the longest single story in the book of Genesis. Abraham's chief servant left with 10 camels loaded with gifts for the future bride and her family. Abraham had become an old man. Now, quoting, this is from um, Patriarchs and Prophets. Okay. Abraham had become an old man and expected soon to die. Yet one act remained for him to do in securing the fulfillment of the promise to his posterity. Isaac was the one divinely appointed to succeed him as the, as the keeper of the law of God and the father of the chosen people. But he was yet unmarried. How old was he? Forty. Forty. The inhabitants of Canaan were given to idolatry, and God had forbidden intermarriage between his people and them, knowing that such marriages would lead to apostasy. Now, Abraham had hundreds of men who had been circumcised and presumably were worshippers of the true God. Couldn't he have married the daughter of one of those men? You would have thought. Well, anyway... The patriarch feared the effect of the corrupting influences surrounding his son. In the mind of Abraham, the choice of a wife for his son was a matter of grave importance. He was anxious to have him, him marry one who would not lead him from God. Isaac, trusting to his father's wisdom and affection, was satisfied to commit the matter to him, believing also that God himself would direct in the choice made. So why didn't Abraham choose a bride for his son from the daughters of the large company of trained soldiers and converts? Hmm. I guess one day we'll have to wait and see that panorama and see what was going on there. But uh, anyway, I guess these guys are, are lucky because when we read the story of Abraham finding wife Isaac and we later read the story of uh, Jacob going and finding his wife Rachel, they both ended up with beautiful women. Well, read Isaiah 40, 24, 10 to 67. I'm sorry, Genesis. I, we, I do not have, we do not have time to read that whole section, but especially verses 12 through 28 about seeking a bride for Isaac. Can you do that for us, Jim? He prayed, Lord, God of my master Abraham, give me success today and keep your promise to my master. Here I am at the well where the young women of the city will be will be coming to get water. I will say to one of them, please lower your jar and let me have a drink. If she says drink, and I will also bring water for your camels, may, may she be the one that you will have chosen for your servant I, Isaac. It is, if this happens, I will know that you have kept your promise to my master. Before he had finished praying, Rebecca arrived with a water jar on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, who was the son of Abraham's brother Nahor and his wife Milcah. She was a very beautiful young woman and still a virgin. She went down to the well, filled her jar, and came back. The servant ran to meet her and said, Please give me a drink of water from your jar. She said, Drink, sir, and quickly lowered her jar from me, lowered her jar from her shoulder and held it while he drank. Then he had excuse me, when he had finished, she said, I will also bring water for your camels and let them have all they want. Wow. She, she quickly emptied her jar into the animal's drinking trough and ran to the well to get more water until she had watered all his camels. Do you, know how kept, much, do you know how much water a camel can drink at one time? <laughs> I made quite a bit. Gallons. Yeah. Gallons, I can tell you. The man kept watching her in silence to see if the Lord had given him success. When she had finished, the man took an expensive gold ring and put it in her nose and put two large gold bracelets on her arm. He now, said, I'm, 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 I'm trying to imagine here... A stranger shows up. You've never seen this person before. He has camels loaded with all sorts of stuff. He has traveled a long way. He's probably dirty, dusty, and so forth like this. And he starts asking questions. Then he said, let me put this in your nose. Let me put these on your arms. And she's saying... Well, when it's gold rings and, and so on, you might let him. I, I, let's ask Myra. How would you feel about that? Well... 
in today's, nobody's putting a gold ring in my nose. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, but maybe gold bracelets on your arm? I would be probably not go for that either. But obviously this was something cultural. Obviously he, he had a plan. She apparently, I don't know whether he tried to tell, I mean, he must have said something about what his goal was to her before he started giving her gold things. Well, if it took that long to water the camels, they probably had some yeah. time to talk. <laughs> okay. He said, please tell me your, who your father is. Is there room in this, in his house for my men and me to spend the night? My father is Bethuel, son of Nahor and Milcah, she answered. There is plenty of straw and fodder at our house, and there is a place for you to stay. Then the men knelt down, excuse me, then the man knelt down and worshiped the Lord. He said, Praise the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has faithfully kept his promise to my master. The Lord has led me straight to my master's relatives. Good news, I, Bible. I want you to notice something interesting here. What does he call God in this passage? Yahweh. Yahweh. And when we get over to the story of Moses, many generations, of, several generations later, it sounds like Yahweh is a brand new idea. Is this Moses using that name in retrospect, or is it uh, because he's the one that wrote this? Mm-hmm in Genesis, and um, I don't know. I'm asking you to think about it. The story of Abraham's servant traveling to Haran to get a wife for Isaac is amazing. It is a story full of miracle, miraculous answers to prayer and a young woman's willingness to venture into the unknown to take a husband. Was God, was God working step by step to help Abraham accomplish his goals? Compare and contrast the story of Abraham's servant traveling to Haran accompanied by 10 camels loaded with gifts versus the journey that Jacob made to Haran many years later as he was fleeing from his brother. Think of Eliezer, Abraham's servant traveling about 500 miles from the place where Abraham was staying all the way to Haran to find a wife for Isaac. How would you like to have that responsibility? Eliezer clearly took it seriously consider his prayer. As far as we know, Eliezer had never been to Haran before. He, before. he was a, in a country unknown to him, and he was supposed to be finding the right wife for Isaac. Carrie? Eliezer asks for the success of the operation. The Hebrew verb, hagre, give me success, uh, Genesis 24, 12, New King James Version, derives from the verb quara, which means to happen, and conveys the idea of chance. So what are we saying here? We're saying, God, I'm here. I have no idea who I'm looking for, or where they live, anything about. Please control chance and take me to the right place. That's what he's saying, okay? Make, make things work out. Make things work out, okay? The notion of accidental chance has no room here. The fact that God is in control of chance means that he will operate within the parameters of what appears to be chance from a human viewpoint. Can you think of some time when we had very specific chance-like things happen and God seemed to be in control? Do you remember reading about casting lots? Several times. Yeah, yeah. Several times in scriptures. We do not know exactly how they did it. Some people think that they had a collection of stones with like maybe eight or nine or ten black ones and one white one, and you put your hand in if you happen to come up with a white one, you something like that. I mean, there's lots of possible ways that that could happen. But, uh, you know, God made it work. He is the God of providence who can cause the event to occur. This view is reinforced by the fact that the servant goes so far as to determine not only the moment of this event, which should 
take place right away, Genesis 24, 12, but also the place that should be right here, where the servant has, quote, made his camels to kneel down, quote, Genesis 24, 11, and where he stands by the well of water, Genesis uh, 24, 13. So this, um, this guy is praying, but he's praying, I want it to be here, I want it to be right now, <laughs> I want this to happen. And there it was. Is that asking too much? Abraham's servant was amazed at the quick response that God provided in answer to his prayer. The fact that Rebekah did exactly what he had prayed for was amazing. It certainly should have, been, should have confirmed Eliezer's faith. It's interesting to notice that despite this incredible effort to obtain a wife, God made sure through his directions to Eliezer that Rebekah was free to refuse if she wanted to. Go, wanted to. God never forces humans. Dwayne? Hence we see here another example of the great mystery of how God has given us as humans free will, free choice, a freedom that he will not trample on. If he did trample, it would not be free will. And yet somehow, despite the reality of human free will and many of the terrible choices humans make with that free will, we can still trust that in the end, God's love and goodness ultimately will prevail. From our Bible study guide for Wednesday, May 18. Much later, just before the birth of Jesus, we have this comment by Ellen White. My, my turn. Ira? The earth was dark through misapprehension of God. That the gloomy shadows might be lightened, that the world might be brought back to God. Satan's deceptive power was to be broken. This could not be done by force. The exercise of force is contrary to the principles of God's government. He desires only the service of love, and love cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force or authority. Only by love is love awakened. To know God is to love him. His character must be manifest in the con in contrast to the character of Satan. This work only one, this work only one being in the universe can do. So why is Jesus the only one who can correctly represent God? He's the only one that could live on this earth and... <laughs> He's only he, is he is God. <laughs> he yeah. is God, that's the reason, yeah. Yeah, he is God. Um, where was I? Only he. Oh. Only he who knew the height and depth of the love of God could make it known. Upon the world's dark night, the, the Son of Righteousness must rise with healing in his wings. Malachi 4, 2. And in Desire of Ages, page 22. That's a wonderful passage in the first page of Desire of Ages. Prophecies like Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 through 9 might suggest that God arbitrarily makes things work the way he wants them to. You might think, okay, here are these great, you know, nations that do this and that and the other, and so God is just in control. We really don't have any freedom, right? This story of finding a wife for Isaac suggests that that is not true. Even one individual was allowed freedom. God works with us despite our failings and our problems. God is able to predict the future far in advance, but he does not force our choices. Isaac was comforted after the death of his mother. When Rebekah arrived, Isaac took her into his mother's tent, and she became his wife. Genesis 25, 1-8 tells us that after Sarah died, Abraham married another woman whose name was Keturah. She bore him six sons. These sons were not counted as sons of the promise like Isaac was, so before he died, Abraham gave them generous gifts as an inheritance and sent them off to, the, in, to live in the east along with Ishmael. Then the rest of, her inheritance, of his inheritance was given to Isaac. Abraham died at the age of 175. So who was Keturah? Where did she come from? From the Bible study guide for Thursday. Yet the identities of his new wife is unclear. 
the fact that the chronicler associates Keturah's sons together with Hagar's sons without mentioning the name of Keturah suggests, however, that Keturah could, as some have suggested, be Hagar. It also is significant that Abraham behaves with Keturah's sons the same way he did with Hagar's son. He sends them away to avoid any spiritual influence and make a clear distinction between his son with Sarah and the other sons. He also gives, quote, all that he had unto Isaac, close quote, Genesis 25, 5, while he gave gifts to the sons of the concubines. The classification of concubines may also imply that Keturah's status like Hagar, was that of a concubine. The potential identification of Keturah as Hagar may also explain the subtle allusion to the memory of Sarah as a prelude to his marriage with Keturah-Hagar. Okay. Well, there's some interesting ideas I want you to think about. Uh, Could it be that this is the same woman? I mean, he's already had one son with her. If she's still around, we don't know if she's still around. But uh, there's a possibility, interesting. By the way, when it talks about the chronicler, who's that? Ezra. Probably Ezra, the one who wrote the book of Chronicles, and that's why he's called the chronicler. Probably Ezra, the writing when? About 1,500 years after Abraham. It is possible that men- mentioning uh, once again Ishmael's descendants and the descendants of Keturah was evidence of the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham that he would be the father of many nations. While Isaac himself only had two sons and Esau soon departed in his ways and his habits from Jacob who inherited the spiritual inheritance, Jacob then produced 12 sons who inherited the, um, whose descendants became the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob had two wives and two concubines. And you can read about it, Genesis 25, 7 through 11. I don't have time to read through all that. And all this, do you see evidence that Abraham was a great example of faith? How do you interpret Romans 4, 1 to 12 that tells us that he was a great example of faith? Do you have experiences in your own life where God provided amazing answers to prayer? Should we expect that all the time or from time to time? Or do we need to have faith like Abraham before something like that could happen to us? That's a question I'd like you to think about as you consider these subjects for our lesson this week. Shall we pray? Our kind and wonderful Father, we've come here to talk about your word, to think about what we maybe can learn from these passages and to read the experiences, ups and downs and backs and forths of these people who are described as great examples of faith. And Lord, they give us us courage because we also have ups and downs and backs and forths of faith. Help our faith to strengthen. May we draw nearer to you and may we soon be a part of your kingdom is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.